And at this time, I would like to introduce our very uh, patient principal, Mr. Justin Berman. Mr. Justin Berman, one of the best principals in New York City. Thank you, Mr. LaBella. That's quite an introduction. Uh, I don't know uh, that, that, that's quite absurd. But thank you. If anybody has any questions about anything that, 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 that we're we talking about so far, I'm happy uh, to share with you sort of, you know, my thoughts and my thoughts about education, and you'll learn a little bit about my philosophy about education. Those of you who are new and those of you who are, you who are here sort of know what I, what I think about education and really doing what's best for kids. And if it's good for kids, we do it. If it's not good for kids, we don't do it. I do think that a lot of the things that we do are good for all kids, no matter what. Really, whether they're rich, poor, disabled, uh, uh, not disabled, general education, special education, whatever. I think the things that we do are kind of things that will help all children. And uh, I, I hope to punctuate that tonight by, by, by showing you uh, a little bit happening uh, in our school. Just even recently, over the past couple of days, I hope you got a chance to see that really cool piano downstairs in the uh, in the cafeteria. Those are, that piano was one of 50 pianos that was created by um, a group called Song of Hope. And that was a group that was put together about 10 years ago by artists and musicians in New York City as a way for musicians and artists to give back to the community as a way to contribute. So they created these 10 really cool pianos and asked different artists to create a theme for each piano. Well, Mr. Farragut, one of our music teachers, our chorus teacher, in fact, applied to get one of these pianos. And sure enough, we were selected as one of those pianos. And what's also really interesting about piano is that the artist um, is a woman who's created other pianos and worked with her husband for on different projects. And she decided to create this piano with her daughter, who was a former student of the Christopher Apollo School. Isn't that cool? So uh, I don't think it was a coincidence yeah, uh, that, that that piano got here. If it was, it really was just an amazing coincidence. But uh, I think once we were selected for that piano through whatever the process was, I think she probably had a hand. And, I, and I'd like to invite her, I'm glad to invite her to come and talk about the piano because it is very much uh, it very much tells a story, tells a story about Irish immigration and the plight of, uh, of, of folks who were really coming to our country and the contributions that they made. So uh, it's really poignant. Uh, I think they really made a great choice in selecting our school because, the, you know, the, the kids, and, and we didn't just say, oh, it was a piano, I spoke to the children, we talked about it, we talked about the significance, we talked about it really being their piano, and it is their piano, and it's there for them to create. And so you can see, you know, come, come stop by any day you want during lunch and you'll see kids just sort of playing and talking and, and, and they're really taking good care of it. It's the adults on the one hand that sometimes I worry about because they're really interested in making sure the hand, kids' hands are clean and so forth. So they put a bottle of Purell on top of the piano with like some paper towels under it. And I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't work. <laughs> so, so it's really the adults that I'm more concerned about than, uh, than the children. But so uh, that was that was something um, really great and uh, and cool that uh, that happened. The other thing. Uh, I hope that you had an opportunity to see. And if you if you didn't, please drive a walk around the block. I hope you have seen the mural that's on the handball wall. Raise your hand if you've seen the mural. Okay, cool. I hope raise your hand if when you saw that mural, you said, "Wow." Maybe you did not out loud to yourself. Good. So please, if you haven't seen that mural, take a look at it. The kids worked so hard to put that mural together, and there is so much imagery 
in that mural about all different kinds of people that uh, it's, it's, it's really incredibly special and, and we do hope to have sort of a ribbon clinic for that and invite uh, Carlos Machaca, who's our city councilman, who helped fund that mural and will really uh, sort of celebrate. Uh, it's really a celebration of diversity, so uh, we're really happy uh, and excited about that. Some other really great things going on. Our coffee shop is finally opening after a lot of battles, a lot of deliberation. Uh, our hydroponics and aquaponics lab is finally getting off the ground, and we expect construction to start with that uh, next week. So that will be really great. Uh, there was a bit of a delay behind that. And um, there, uh, you know, and we'll work together with our school leadership team to come up with some ideas for future projects. I'd really like to work on renovating the auditorium and getting some seats that are, let's just say, 21st century rather than, you know, 1930 uh, seats. Uh, be a little bit more comfortable uh, for you and for the kids. So, so we'll work on that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, I want to talk about some of our instructional initiatives this year and some of the things that we're working on and focusing on. This year, we're going to have a quality review, which means that some folks, I don't know who they are anymore, um, will come and assess our school and evaluate us. They'll come for two days, they'll go to classrooms, they'll be with teachers, they'll be with parent groups, uh, teacher groups, and uh, they'll, they'll assess us. So I'm always happy to show off our school. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of success uh, with people who have come to visit our school, and um, assuming they don't have a particular agenda, and uh, I feel so fun tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm not really concerned uh, at all about that. Particularly because I feel so strongly and comfortable about the work that we're doing and the initiatives that we're working on. Uh, in particular, really going beyond the idea of uh, you know, mathematics and social studies and ELA and the subjects that the kids have. You know we've got an incredible number of enrichment offerings, whether it's sports medicine or biotechnology or law classes or art classes, uh, music classes. We, we now have almost 10% of our teaching staff are arts teachers. Almost 10%. We've got a chorus teacher, a band teacher, we have two visual arts teachers, and we have a theater teacher. We have more arts teachers than most schools twice the size of us. So arts is really important to what we do here. We invested a lot of money in classroom furniture last year, almost $100,000 in classroom furniture. And we got some really cool things for the, the students. It's, they're really useful. I saw them at uh, Bainton when I went up to visit with my son, and they had these all-in-one desks that um, were just, they were so comfortable, and it allowed the children to really move around uh, at, at, in an appropriate way in the classroom. So that's been really cool, and that's been working really well. Um, really working to raise the level of engagement. It's very much more important to have a conversation with, with a new teacher today, and um, they were talking about you know, social studies, uh, you know, curriculum, and I said, okay, so, you know, what lesson are you going to give tomorrow? We'll be doing our initial conference. And uh, so the teacher was like, well, uh, you know, I'm going to do, you know, what is social studies? I'm going to talk about social studies. Uh, talk about social studies. And it was a good opportunity for me to clarify. That's not the idea. It's not what is social studies. What is social studies is not the kind of question that we start with. We start with interesting questions, questions that are problems, questions that require thought, questions, questions that require you to create other questions to answer them, to get to the point where at the end of the lesson, aha, now we know what social studies is, rather than what is social studies. So there's really a shift. You know, and I use this example too with the teachers. Those, 
how many of you went to public school in New York City? Okay. Uh, Tri-state area? United States? Okay. No, no, I, I asked that for a reason, because I, I, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to know what curriculum materials are like in other countries, but I know here in the United States, most books, for example, I remember the social studies book that I had when I was in, you know, in school, whether it was high school, middle school, or whatever. There was a chapter, and then there was a section, right? And you read the section, it was a section to read for homework or something like that, right? And then there were five questions at the end of the section. Right? Questions one, two, and three were who was this, where did this happen, and when did this occur, basically. Very factual based questions. Question four was, you know, okay, you know, tell them a little bit, maybe think a little bit. And question five was the greatest question, but you never got a sign that question. Why? Because it took a lot of time. It took a lot of time, and teachers weren't going to do that in the classroom. But you see, there in lies the problem. That question shouldn't be in the end. That's the question that's got to be in the beginning. That's the most interesting question of all. And it's the question that the kids don't know the answer to. Which is the way it should be. Because if they already know the answer to the question, why are you teaching it to them? Right? So we start with the interesting things. We motivate the kids. We want them to learn more. Create questions. And then facts aren't important anymore. They really aren't. If you step home, you can look up anything you want. Anything you want. Raise your hand if you were here last year and you saw the Simon Sinek video that we showed about millennials and students and parents and right? Okay, we're gonna do that again. We're not gonna do it this time because it's a, it's a little too long for our purposes here. I know that you will enjoy it, and I'm going to promise you that at the next PTA meeting we'll watch that. And I won't tell you any more other than you will really enjoy it, and I'll use that as a lure to get you to come to the next meeting. But in the meantime, I do have a video clip that I do want to show you, which will punctuate the idea of oracy, O-R-A-C-Y, oracy, which is a word that kids know, probably roll their eyes, and you say, hey, tell me about oracy, and you should do that when you go home, right? And ask them, and hopefully they've got a lot to say, if they don't, please let me know because something's wrong. Uh, so uh, let me get this going and I'll give you uh, about a six minute overview of the kinds of things that we're doing. And I think you'll very much. We have a partner school. They're not really a partner school, we have a partnership with them. Uh, the uh, Staten Island Technical High School. Uh, we visited them last year and we learned a lot from them. We brought back this idea of oracy. Uh, they didn't invent this idea. Uh, we used to, as part of the English language arts exam, have a listening component. A speaking component, not really a speaking component, but at least a listening component. That's gone. Listening and speaking are skills that are really important for children. Being smart, meaning Getting the right answers on a test or being able to write a letter is not enough anymore. It's just not enough. Kids need more. What do they need? I'll show you. Today, the next. This is the end of a term's worth of research on key topics around the London mayor election and they're ready to debate each other to make sure they've got the winning argument. Because of all the horrors happening in lessons, we've seen students showing their moral dexterity beyond their years. We've seen them able to be thrown to different situations to judge the audience, to understand how to present themselves, so it both raises standards and prepares them for the future. themselves, you give them the power to realize that 
who they are, who they want to be, and the voice is the very thing that's going to make them successful. Talk is my number one thing I'm going to be using in my life. All of us here talk, and everyone's voice matters. Oracy is the ability to speak fluently. We believe that oracy speaking is as important as reading and writing. So when they first come in your seven page to them, we ask them, hey, we're going to get to find your voice. We believe that everyone's voice should be heard, even though they're shy, quiet, or loud. And we're going to make sure by the end of the year, you can do a five minute speech on a topic of your passion. The book should be about three or four sentences, no longer. If I was in the audience and someone read this to me or said this, would I be hooked by it? Were anyone brave enough to tell me their book? I remember in primary, I would never say a single word. And when teachers used to pick up on me, I used to sit there thinking, oh no, oh no, because I was too scared to speak to people. And now I, I feel like I've changed and I like my new self. Who here have dreams and goals they want to achieve in their lives? Yes, we all do. Stop there. That's it, that's it all. Everything we're doing is about doing the speech, but there is a behind the scene, obviously, framework that we're really referring back to. The four protocols are cognitive, physical, linguistic, and emotional. Now I know what type of things I need in order for my speaking to be successful. It's a lot to keep in mind at first, but we're practicing it all the time in every lesson we're in, and by the time we get to year nine, it's almost instinctive. The familiarity with the framework and make sure that everybody recognises what goes into good oracy has been a key driver within the school. And that means that students give really clear feedback and critique. Let's not be foolish. It teaches them how to present themselves, how to use their bodies, how to use their voices. We must face the facts and recognise that parameterisation is a very beneficial thing. You're standing like in the same spot for the whole speech. You should have stopped walking around. <coughs> And then I would say it was being politics. We wanted to make it like a quite formal debate. So you'd have proposers and opposers on each side and then you'd have a chair. We thought the key thing was to get them to discuss and debate with each other. You actually don't know how good your policy is until you put it to a different context and are asked to do something with it. As with every project, we've invited some experts who are going to judge the quality of the talk. Your job today is to see if you are persuaded by the arguments, because you'll get an opportunity to vote. Just like to say, huge good luck, and let the best group win. Just because it was the first debate I've like truly done, my nerves were getting a bit below my confidence. Morning, everyone. The proposition is all London transport should be privatised. So I'm like. Tradition of nationalisation should be replaced by privatisation. We want to be able to be on time to school, to be on time to work. This is what we value, and we shouldn't mind having to pay a tiny bit more for it. If we stick with the government funded privatising transport, we will only delay the improvement and help of London and especially its people. As we all know, three lines have failed. If we privatise transport, then it's out of our control. Isn't this country a democracy? Why? Why are you so afraid of this change? It's clear to see that TFL is working. We are having strikes more and more regularly. Prices are just going up and up and it's getting less and less efficient. So what writing speeches has helped me with is definitely confidence. I've been able to perform my speech in front of a big crowd. All that practice really does pay off and it's a skill that we can transfer to the rest of our life. Well, that's also, it gives children the opportunity to gain their confidence and find their voice. We ask you to take up this motion. A silent classroom is a classroom where there's untapped voices that aren't heard. And if we believe in democratic education, we have to focus on oracy. The winner of our first debate, Rowena and Mimi. Give them a round of applause.
a small group of students or people. Um, that's just really scratching the surface. The whole idea is that there are many different opportunities that students will have to communicate in different ways. Yes, we do want students to be able to give a presentation, whether it be with groups, uh, in a group, or whether as, uh, as an individual. It's an important skill. But we also want students to be able to communicate well in smaller groups. We want them to be able to communicate well by creating, for example, a YouTube video. We want them to be able to communicate well in a classroom. We want them, and, 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 and these are things that are important not just in school. I have to tell you, because people who are good communicators are successful not just in school, not just in jobs, but they're also successful in really important things like relationships, right? Uh, so, so important. And the thing that occurred to me that last, last October, I went into a classroom and the kids were giving a presentation and the teacher was very frustrated and I felt that frustration and I remembered that frustration from when I was a teacher asking kids to give a presentation because I didn't know all about ORC. And we would give the kids instructions about what to do and what not to do and the children inevitably will do what we ask them not to do. They'll read their notes, they'll stare at the screen, they'll have a page like this which has way too much information on it and read it. You've all been to presentations where people do that. Probably, right? It's not effective. It's not good. So I said, well, why is that? And it occurred to me, I know why it is. It's obvious why it is. We've never taught them how to give a presentation. We have never given them specific skills that they need. And we've never had them practice those specific skills in order to do this what we're seeing here. So if we give them those skills, we know them and we treat it like a skill like anything else, like being able to hit baseball or being able to do math, right? We can evaluate where kids are and say, well, some people are really good at this, some people are not. They might be really good at math, but a terrible speaker, right? Well, it's our job. We're in the business of human development. It's our job to see where you are and help you get better at that. And so some kids will naturally be good at communicating and maybe not be great readers and not test takers. That's okay. And there are some kids who are going to be great test takers who don't have these skills. And those kids are missing out. So just like we have to teach kids who don't know how to read, and we do have those kids here, we need to teach them how to read. Kids who aren't adept at these ORC skills are things that we need to teach them. And we teach them in the context of their classes. We teach them in the context of having a common vocabulary. So when we talk about these four strands, you saw the linguistic, the cognitive, the physical, and so forth. But the kids know what we're talking about. And I want you to know what we're talking about, too. So we're going to do some more work on this. I'm not going to overload you with stuff now, but I promise you that, excuse me, the next meeting, we'll take a look at Simon Sinek, and I'll share some more ORC information with you. Please ask your children about this, and if you want to help your children, talk to them at home, have conversations with them, have discussions with them. Ask them, what do you think about this, and why do you think that? Ask them to justify their opinions. Do you have any information to support what you think? Like I gave the kids uh, something to think about earlier in the week. In the morning, there was a, uh, I heard something on the radio that went Van Chocolate Milk. I'd love to know what the kids think about Van and Chocolate Milk. I mean, it's such a perfect topic to really talk about and think about and debate. And a lot of them are going to say, yeah, we should ban it. It's not good for us. You'd be surprised how many of you say that. And they're going to give you really good reasons and good rationale. Those are the kind of things. Parents want to know what can we do at home to help. These are the kinds of things that, that you can do. Pay attention to what's going on around. Ask them, you know, don't ask, don't ask me how homework. Don't ask me if you did your homework. Ask me, did you do anything fun today? Did your teachers ask you anything? Were there any interesting questions today? Don't ask about grades, don't ask about points. 
Sometimes, yeah, but not all the time. It's not always so important. What's important is, what did they engage with in school today? And hopefully, the more you do that, the more they'll share with you, and the more you can help them. Uh, any questions before we, uh, I guess, find out the results of our election? Well, I'm around, I'm here. Please give us a call, and I hope to see you at the next meeting. More great stuff to come. Thank you very much.